Let's begin reading in verse uh, 1 of chapter 10. And we're looking at Jesus, the good shepherd of the sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will not, they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not the things that they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are the thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and then he shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy, and I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. May God add a, ble a blessing to the reading of His Word. May we have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that's receptive to His Word this morning. As we continue this morning, we're continuing our series that we've entitled Snapshots of the Savior. And during this series, I have shared with you how that I'm going to be sharing messages out of the 21 chapters of John's Gospel so that we can get a clearer picture of Jesus. So far, we've already examined some wonderful, marvelous and, uh, pictures of Jesus. And even though all the gospel writers present various aspects of Jesus and give us snapshots of his life uh, upon this earth, I believe that John gives us some of the most wonderful and the most beautiful pictures of all. John's gospel is so different than the other writers. The other writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke, they primarily wrote with a historical record in mind. But John wrote to, give the, uh, to, to, to tell about the person of Jesus, his deity, and his humanity, and so that we uh, might believe upon him. John's gospel displays the glory of Jesus as no other gospel does because he presents Jesus, the exalted person of Jesus. Over and over we see the word see in John's gospel. And he wants us to, as he unfolds these things, each chapter unfolds, he wants us to see a new facet of Christ's divine and human character. John wanted people to see Jesus. And we even read in John chapter 12, verse 21, we want to see Jesus. We desire to see Him. And that should be our desire. Our desire should be to see and to know Jesus. And this series is all about Jesus as we put the Jesus in front of each of the characters or, or, or the, the titles of our message because uh, there's no greater topic to preach about other than Jesus Christ. He is the theme and heart of every gospel message. The major theme of John's gospel, though, is found in John chapter 20, verse 31. And here's what he said. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. In this chapter, we see Jesus presented as the good shepherd. When Jesus spoke these words, I'm sure that there were some that were sitting there listening who knew the Old Testament. They knew the, the writings of the Psalms, and they probably were reminded of the 23rd Psalm. And as we sung this morning, surely goodness and mercy, and we, 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 we know that's in the 23rd Psalm, but the first verse says, the Lord is my shepherd. And you know, I read about two men who were called upon in a church service to recite, recite the 23rd Psalm. One was a published orator. He, he, had great, he was trained in speech technique and, and drama. He repeated the psalm in a very powerful way. 
When he finished, the audience cheered and, and they even asked for an encore. They stood up and clapped and they wanted to hear more. They wanted to hear more of his wonderful voice. Then the other man, who was much older, he repeated the same words and he started, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. After he finished up, no sound came from the room. Instead, the people sat in deep devotion. There were tears flowing in people's eyes. To break the silence, the first man stood to his feet and he said, I have a confession to make. The difference between what you have just heard from my old friend and what you heard from me is this. I know the psalm, but he knows the shepherd. Do you know the shepherd this morning? Of the many images in John's gospel, one of the most descriptive, one of the most personal is the good shepherd. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, Jesus said, When He saw the multitudes, He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Jesus sees us as scattered as sheep without a shepherd. And like a shepherd, Jesus is concerned for the welfare and care of human beings. He cares for our soul. He is concerned about the, the situation that we are in. In this text, we see Jesus declares His identity, but He also plainly states His purpose. He is a shepherd. And He tells us that's His identity. But He tells us His purpose is to give His life for the sheep. To bring them to a reconciliation between God and man. We see the heart of Jesus as this text reveals, reveals His great love for sinners. It reveals His plan for dealing with our sin. I asked you this question this morning. Do you know the shepherd? Do you know the shepherd? If you say, no, I don't know the shepherd, well, let me encourage you as you listen to this message, you can come to know Him today. You can know Him in the free pardon of sin. You can have a personal relationship with Him the one that died for your sins, the one who loves you more than anyone? If the answer is yes and you know Him, do you really love Him? If you know Him, He says, if you know me, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Do you love Him enough to share with someone else the gospel? Why does Jesus deserve the title, The Good Shepherd? Well, I believe he, he possesses certain qualities that qualify him to be our good shepherd. And I want us to examine three of those this morning. If you have your bulletin on the back of the bulletin, you have your outline. The first point that we look at this morning is the credentials of the good shepherd. The credentials of the good shepherd. In verses 1 through 5, we read here of the credentials. He, he starts out with his credentials. You know, whenever you go to a doctor, when you go to a lawyer, a CPA, when you go to a mechanic... You want to know that they have the right credentials, don't you? Sometimes you'll see their degree hanging up there. You'll see the school they went to. You want to make sure that they have the credentials to do what they say that they can do. And so if Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, we should want to see his credentials or, or know about those credentials. What makes him our good shepherd? Well, he has the right credentials to be our shepherd and savior, first of all, because of his coming. In verses 1 through 3, he talks about uh, the imagery of the sheepfold and how the shepherd comes to the sheepfold and there's a strict purpose there for him coming. He illustrates how he is the good shepherd by talking about he is the, the, the shepherd that comes before and enters through the sheepfold by the door. He came the right way. Others that are hirelings, others that are thieves, others that are, 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 are someone that would be uh, religious gurus or, or, or whatever you might call them, they come another way to deceive you. But Jesus came the right way. And we find here, as you talk, talk about the sheepfold, a sheepfold was a circular wall about 10 feet tall with a single opening that served as the door. Now several flocks were placed in that sheepfold during the night. And the shepherd would lie in the opening. He would lie there in the opening and the sheep would come there and they wouldn't try to cross over or he would fill them. Or if someone tried to come in and steal the sheep, he would feel them coming over the top of him. And so Jesus says that he came the right way. Thieves and robbers will seek to enter the sheepfold by another means beside the door. But the shepherd always comes the right way. The shepherd always comes the right way. Jesus came into this world the right way. 
He came according to God's plan. He came fulfilling prophecies. I want you to see some of the proofs that fulfill the prophecies. The Bible says that he would born, be born of a virgin. He was born of a virgin. So that's the first proof. He, he was born in Bethlehem. The Bible tells us that we, he would be born in Bethlehem of Euphrates. So he came fulfilling that prophecy. He came in the fullness of time, as Galatians says. He came at just the right time in human history to make an impact on the world. The Bible says that the prophecy would be brought out of Egypt. And he was. They went to Egypt and then he came back out of Egypt. Uh, he, he came uh, approved of God as, uh, as he was there and, and God spoke and said, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. He provoked the rage of his enemy, Herod. But he also provoked the rage of the, the Pharisees and other enemies that are opposed to him. All of those were prophesied about him. And he fulfilled all of these prophecies. He came as the right person. He came to the right place. He came at the right time. He came to the right country or the right location. He came fulfilling the right signs. So we could clearly see that He is the Good Shepherd. His credentials prove that He is the Son of God and that He is the Good Shepherd. So when Jesus came, He came with the right credentials. And it mentions here the porter would allow Him to come. The porter was John the Baptist. And what did John the Baptist say when Jesus came to him that day? He openly declared and introduced to him. And he said in John 1.21, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The porter announced to all that this is the Lamb of God. This is the Good Shepherd. So we see His coming. But secondly, in verse 3, we see His call. To Him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear His voice. And He calleth His own sheep by name and leadeth them out. Many flocks were brought into that sheepfold, and they shared the same sheepfold, but when the shepherd walked up to the door and called his sheep, they recognized his voice. They knew his voice. They knew his call. You know, I recently read an, an illustration about a man in Australia who was arrested and charged with stealing a sheep. He claimed emphatically that it was one of his own that had been missing for many days, had wandered off. When the case went to the court, the judge was puzzled about how to, to handle this. He was not knowing how to decide the case. At last he asked the sheep to be brought into the courtroom. And he ordered the plaintiff to step outside and call the animal. The plaintiff did and the sheep made no response except to raise its head and to look a little frightened. The judge then instructed the defendant to go outside and to call the sheep. When the accused man began to make the distinctive call, the sheep ran toward the door. It was obvious that he recognized the familiar voice of his master. His sheep know him, the judge said. Case dismissed. And you may say, well, I don't understand this exactly. But from this standpoint, the Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. So in that illustration, we are all sheep. We're just wandering around. But we don't have a relationship with the shepherd. But when he calls us, we hear his voice. Now you may hear his voice and you respond to him because you have a personal relationship with him. Or you may hear his voice and you say, not today. You may hear that voice of that personal shepherd who is, is, is there, but you say, I'm going to follow my own way. I'm going to do my own thing. But He's calling to all of us. You see, a lost soul knows the voice of Jesus. If you're a lost soul, you, you know and you feel that conviction in your heart that someone is calling you, drawing you to a relationship with Him. And you hear that voice and you dismiss it. and You say, oh, I don't know what that, that voice is. I, I don't understand what that is. You've not got enough spiritual light to understand. Or maybe you do know. And you're under conviction, but you just say no. You know, there are many voices that compete for our attention in this world. But the voice of Christ is special. When He calls, everything changes. When He calls, you know it's Him. Because see, we're sinners. We're dead in our sins. But when He calls, we are awakened to spiritual things that we never wanted to be a part of before. We begin to, to want to look in the Bible and, and find some answers. We, we begin to want to hear someone preach and tell us the good news of the gospel because that voice is calling us. The good shepherd has awakened us. The voice of the good shepherd gives us hope. 
when we're discouraged. The, the voice of the Good Shepherd refreshes us uh, and brings us that water that we need and refreshment that we need. The voice of the Good Shepherd sounds good to us who is a desperate soul. All other voices, all other calls are empty. They frighten us. They're not worth listening to. But we need to listen to the Good Shepherd. But then we see another credential is His commands. In verses 4 and 5, He putteth forth His own sheep, He goeth before them, and the sheep follow Him, for they know His voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from Him, for they know not the voice of strangers. When the shepherd calls, notice He goes before them. Jesus will never ask you to go anywhere that He has not went before you. He wants you to follow Him. Not get ahead of Him, but to follow Him. See, He goes before us, and, and we this instinctively is the more follow Him. For the sound. Notice something else. We've already about gone this over what these he knobs do for the in. volume, what these buttons do for mute. You know, it's almost like in a room full of cats. Unmute you ever on tried each to hurt individual channel. We've gone over they how go you their own way. They look at you and they go over which and way. As you can see, we but have two outputs kind of that way. They, they just, one for the nursery you can't push them. and one for the main kind of output there. in the sanctuary. They're kind of frightened when you, when you raise your in voice addition to them. But when you we actually leave have them, three you more outputs that, that are way, they'll follow you. For the choir, they have a floor speaker and, and a choir that voice, speaker that, that are set up down there that point towards them and give them a special audio feed that isn't really heard out here because and when a soul is they can't saved, hear the main as well as we can. The main speaker is pointed towards the sanctuary and the choir sits those that in the New behind Testament those speakers. So we have a dedicated channel that feeds to they them. Left everything they had in addition to those two, we have a special channel for recording. And for service. You don't always want the same mix when we're for your saved, recording our, because our you want it to sound right, a little bit different than you're going right, to make we it sound to the We do not have to be begged to come to worship. We're out for that channel. We don't have to be begged. And that's how those work. There's that desire we want to follow the shepherd. We have a desire, and we know it's, that it's the be master there, out and, and for that. We can't channel. be there. We want to be there. And that's and how when those we work. Just blatantly lay out, and we don't go. Something speaks to our heart and says, "You missed service today. I missed that time of fellowship with you." So we have that desire, and we don't have to be begged to, to worship. We don't have to be begged to tithe or give uh, to the Lord. We don't have to be begged to share our faith or to teach a class. We have a burning desire to worship and to serve Him. You know, there are many people that they say they're called into the ministry. They're called in some capacity. But they're waiting and for somebody to give them a job to do. If you are called to do something, you don't have to wait for anybody. And in fact, when I hear of someone that says they are called to a ministry, the first thing I look is, where are they serving the Lord? If they're not already serving the Lord, then I have to doubt whether they have actually been called. Because when you are called, I remember when I was called, I, I was teaching a Sunday school class and I just loved, and I poured myself into that, that, that Sunday school class. But I accepted the call to preach and I didn't start preaching right then. But I was pouring myself into the lives of people teaching a Sunday school class. And I was preparing messages, so to speak, while I was teaching that class. And God began to see, and others began to see how that class was growing. And people were coming to the church, and, and they were joining the church, and that people were getting saved. And they said, there's something there. We see God working, and the hand is upon Him. And they licensed me to preach. And then I preached for several years, but I also sung in a quartet. But I was still serving God, using what God gave me. And then it was not until after I quit the quartet that God opened up the opportunity to pastor, and I was ordained. But you know what a lot of people want? They want to be ordained before they're ever called because it's a status. I have all this knowledge and I'm, I'm good at it, but we need to follow Him. And when we're following Him, we will serve Him in any capacity. You know, Paul, uh, it was David that said, I would rather just be a gatekeeper in the house of the Lord than to be the one that was doing all the great work. You show me someone who is willing to do the small task in a church, and they're willing to do that, and God will begin to use them and give them more to do later. But you look at someone who wants the high position right off the bat without working, without serving the Lord in small capacities, God's not going to bless that individual because they're doing it for sale. So we follow the, the, the good shepherd. But then secondly, I want you to see the character of the good shepherd. In verses 6 through 10, he begins to talk about the character. They didn't understand him. But he began to talk about how the good shepherd is the door. 
In verse 6 through 8, he talks about his personality. He is identified as the door. We know he is identified as the light. He is identified as, as many things here in the Gospel of John. But he's not just a door. He is the door. He is the only way you can come into the sheepfold. He is the only way you can have a personal relationship with a heavenly Father. You see, man is, is a sinner. Man is sinned, and we need a Savior. We need a perfect, sinless sacrifice to die for our sins. And you know what? Jesus came to be that sacrifice. And He reveals Himself as the door to which you can enter into salvation and be saved and have a relationship with God. Remember, there was only one opening going in and out of the sheepfold. The shepherd would lay, in essence, across that. And so Jesus is pointing out that just as that was a picture of, 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 of the shepherd, He is the door. He is the one laying there and you have to enter or come to Him through Him. You come to that sheepfold through Him. If anyone desires to have a relationship with the Heavenly Father, there's only one door and that's Jesus. Jesus said about Himself in John 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by how? But by me. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter was preaching that great sermon where many souls were saved. He said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John, later in 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. There is life in him, and you enter life through the door. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, says, There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Any other door, any other way, any other person that you might come try to come to God leads to death and damnation. Jesus is the only one that leads to life and a relationship with God. In fact, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Well, we see His personality tells us He is, has the character to be the good shepherd, but we see His performance. Notice verse 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. He said, you will be saved through me because I am the only way of salvation. I am dying for your sins. I will lay down my life for your sins. Jesus, Jesus plainly says the only way to be saved and have salvation is through Him. In these verses, He promises salvation, but He also promises daily fellowship with you and me. He says you will be saved. What does the word saved mean? It means to be rescued from harm and danger. He saw the danger that we were in. He saw we're like sheep gone astray, wandering here and there, and getting into all kinds of things that are evil and harmful to us. We also had the wrath of God upon us. But He has delivered us from that wrath. He has delivered us from that evil and that sin, that power and that presence of sin. In John chapter 5, verse 24, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall, come, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So we see his performance is he, he saves us. But then notice his promise. In verses 9 and 10, he said, uh, You shall be saved, you shall go in and out. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. He promises us abundant life. The best way that I can describe this is he promises in two words that start with a Q. He promises a quality of life that the world can't offer. It is a quality of life that, that man cannot match or touch. But then it is a quantity of life that goes on forever. It is eternal. So He gives us the kind of life that we were destined to live before we came to know Him and what we had in the Garden of Eden. He gives us that life that we can live every day upon this earth. We can honor Him and glorify Him. We can have peace and victory. But then when we die, we're going to go to heaven. and We're going to experience life eternally there in heaven. The thief is a threat to the sheep, though. 
He says the, sheep, the, the thief will enter to use the sheep for their personal gain. They don't care about the welfare of the sheep. The good shepherd comes to the sheep that they might experience life that is better than what they have today. And he even lays down his own life for the sheep. You see, when you come to the good shepherd, everything changes. When a person meets Jesus, their life changes. When he enters into a heart, that life cannot remain the same. They will live better. They will love better. They will even laugh better when they're a Christian. They do all to glorify Him. The third thing that we see this morning is the concern of the Good Shepherd. In verses 11 through 16, we see His concern is shown to us in three ways. First of all, we see it through His sacrifice. In verses 11 through 15, He says that He is the Good Shepherd and He gives His life for the sheep. And then He talks about the hireling. The hireling is not there. He's not there for the sheep. He sees the wolf coming. He leaves the sheep, flees, and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and careth not for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for my sheep. He repeated himself in that section to say that I am the good shepherd and a good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. Anyone else that tries to lead you, that's not willing to die for you, and is not concerned about your life, is not one you need to follow. Jesus shows the difference between a shepherd and a hireling. He said the hireling is only there for a paycheck. He runs away when trouble comes. He leaves the sheep to be devoured by wolves. But you see, the shepherd has a vested interest in the sheep. He's willing to pay any price to protect the sheep, even if he has to give his life. It's not about a livelihood, but it's about love. It's not about a paycheck, but it's about his passion. Now, Jesus is the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep, and we understand that. But you know, the Bible also talks about in the Gospels, I mean in the epistles, about being a shepherd of the flock. And he's talking about pastors. He's talking about those servants who are considered pastors because uh, they're the local shepherd there in that flock. A good pastor is one that is not there for a livelihood, but he's there because he loves people. He's not there for a paycheck, but he has a passion to see souls come to know the Lord and draw closer to Him and have a relationship with Him and grow in knowledge uh, of grace and truth. He's concerned for them. And... If he really loves his sheep, he's willing to do anything. He's willing to do anything to bring them to a relationship, to to bring them back in and and hunt for them, to, to pray for them, to be concerned for them. Jesus proved his concern for people, and shepherds in the local church should do the same. You see, if you have a shepherd who, when trouble comes, he leaves the flock, he was just there for a paycheck. He was not there to serve the Lord. If he's not concerned for the growth of the church and the growth of people, he's not there, but nothing but a paycheck. It's about the people. It's about serving the Lord and serving them. You see, when Jesus sees the danger that we were in, he didn't run away, but he ran to the cross and he embraced it. Because Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We're the sheep that have went astray, but the Lord laid upon Jesus our iniquity because He didn't run away from from going to the cross. God there said to His Son, I have a plan to redeem man. Will you go? He didn't say, "Well, well, let me pray about it. Let me check my calendar. He said, no, I will go. I will go. He went to the cross. He laid down His life for us. You see, sin had separated our fellowship between God and the relationship we had with God was broken and we were under the wrath of God and Jesus came to die for us. Being under His wrath, under the wrath of God, it would culminate in every lost sinner being cast into hell. And Jesus did something to change that. He came down. Willingly came down. He was born in flesh. He lived a sinless life. He died on a cross. He took the place of every sinner. He died a terrible death. 
We celebrated that this morning as we partook of the Lord's Supper, remembering what He did. Think of what He endured for sinners. There is no, no death more horrible than the one that He is, has died. First of all, He was beaten. Not just a simple few stripes on His back, beaten. He was beaten till the flesh was coming off, ripped away from Him. Bones were showing. Internal organs, I believe, were showing. He was beaten so badly. He was mocked, sped upon. They plucked his beard. They whipped him with the cat of nine tails. They put a crown of thorns upon his brow. And he endured it all because he loved us. That's the good shepherd. By that priceless sacrifice for the sheep, he deserves the title, the good shepherd. Why did he have to die? Because Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, Almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. He died to pay for our sin. See, blood was required. That shed blood uh, was, was taken back. And when Jesus ascended back to the throne, that's the mercy seat. And remember the picture in the Old Testament. I believe He took that blood back to heaven at the mercy seat. And He offered that perfect sacrifice to His Father. We can thank God for the blood because it is the sinner's only plea. And we must remember that He died for us. One day a man went to visit a church. He got there early. He parked his car and he got out. Another car rolled up beside him and he got out and said, I always park there. You took my place. The visitor went inside for Sunday school. He found an empty seat. He sat down. He began to prepare and get ready for Sunday school. A young lady from the church approached him and said, That's my seat. You took my place. The visitor was some, somewhat distressed. and by, by, It was very rude. It was a rude welcome. But he didn't say anything. After Sunday school, the visitor went into the sanctuary. He sat down. And another member walked up to him and said, That's where I always sit. You took my place. The visitor was even more tr troubled by the treatment, but he still said nothing. Later, the congregation was praying during their service to open their service that, that Jesus would, would come into their midst, that He would be welcome there. The man stood up and his appearance began to change. Horrible scars became visible on his hands. He took his shirt off and there was even more scars on his back. Someone from the congregation, called out and said, What's wrong with that man? What happened to you? The visitor replied as his hat became a crown of thorns. Tears fell from his eyes. He said, I took your place. He took our place. That's the good shepherd. So he gave us his sacrifice. But secondly, in verse 14, we see his satisfaction that he gives us. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. He's talking about a relationship, a bond that exists between the shepherd and his sheep. They know him. And they will not follow another. They have a relationship with him. They have fellowship with him on a daily basis. You see, the shepherd knows his sheep. Individual sheep in a flock all look alike to the untrained eye. Have you ever went out to see a farmer? Maybe he's got cattle, he's got sheep. And to you, you look at all of them and they kind of look the same. Now there may be some colors and you can distinguish some markings or a different color, but sometimes they have all the same color of sheep. They all look alike. But that shepherd many times has them named and he'll call out this name. He'll speak to that one. He'll tell you the, the, the problems with that one and, and the little things about that one that you wouldn't see if you didn't know he was a shepherd. A good shepherd can tell them apart because of their defects, because of their peculiar traits. And you know, there's millions of people in the world, but the good shepherd knows us all. He knows all of our weaknesses. He knows our failings. He shows us grace and love and mercy. He, he knows every hair upon our head. He knows uh, every uh, strength and every weakness we have. He knows every joy and burden that we uh, face or have ever went through. He knows every mountain and valley that we've endured. He knows every victory and battle that we've been through. Because there is a personal relationship that we have with Him. He also says He will never leave us nor forsake us. He will always be there. 
The last thing we see this morning as we look at the concern of the Good Shepherd, we see is security. He offers security. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of the fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. He said there will be other sheep that will come later, that will come afterwards. That's good news to us because he's talking about us. We are the other sheep that have come after he declared he was the good shepherd. And others that will come after us that will be a part of the body of Christ. Anyone who needs salvation can rest assured that when they come to Jesus, in simple faith, he will provide that salvation for them. When a faith is placed in him, you will be saved. When a person receives his offer of salvation, that salvation is complete. In fact, Hebrews 7.25 says, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. It's not only complete, but our salvation is secure. It is eternal. John chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My friend, He's still the door today. He's opening the door for you to have a relationship with Him. He is still the good shepherd that when you receive Him and you know Him personally, He provides for you. He cares for you. He, he, he's concerned about you. And like the shepherd of Luke chapter 15, in Luke chapter 15, you have the three things that were lost there. And I didn't have these scriptures in, in there, but I'm going to read them to you. But in Luke chapter 15, verses 4 through 7, it says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which was lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance." Jesus is that good shepherd there that goes out and searches for us, comes to where we are. He comes to the mountain of sin searching for us who are lost. We're away from the fold and He brings us in. He carries us on His shoulders. All of us who respond to Him in faith will be brought back into the fold and we will be eternally saved. There is absolutely no question that Jesus is the good shepherd. And the question this morning, do you know the good shepherd? Can you say with personal conviction... The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You see, your answer makes the difference between heaven and hell. Because when we put the words my in Psalm 23 verse 1, it means that we know the shepherd and the shepherd knows us. As Mary Elizabeth comes and Donna comes this morning, we'll have a song of invitation. We've spoken about the good shepherd and I asked the question, do you know him this morning? If you don't, this would be a wonderful and marvelous opportunity for you to come to know Him. And if you already know the shepherd, then is your relationship where it needs to be? Is there a decision that you need to make this morning? A spiritual decision that you need to make to follow Him in some way, to be obedient to Him in some area of your life. If there is, I pray that you stand as people are in a prayerful mood as we sing this song this morning. Say